share the agenda. Okay. Um, so I'd like to welcome everyone. It's good to see everyone again as we're moving into a new stage of the pandemic. We haven't quite left it behind, but um, at least we've moved a little bit forward and right before the surge that's building right now. But you know, I'm hoping by the time we get to CIT, things will settle back down again. Um, and maybe we'll be able to move something, something closer to what we experienced um, before the pandemic as we move into the fall. But it's been an interesting adventure and it's been certainly a challenging experience. And people have never worked quite as hard in higher ed as we have the past couple of years. So I just would like to welcome everyone and um, we'll start the meeting with Carrie, um, who is the Senior Associate Provost for Academic Services. And I will stop my share. Sorry about that. I should know better. Um, just wanted to give you folks a few highlights of uh, what's going on here in Albany this budget season. Um, so that makes things very interesting. Uh, we don't have a budget yet, uh, but based on the um, statements of the governor in the state of the state, um, we are very excited about the coming year. And uh, not only the statements she made, but actually the executive budget um, that she proposed and the um, assembly and Senate um, budgets as well. Um, so there's good alignment there. It looks like there's going to be significant investment made in SUNY um, in this coming budget year. Um, and we're really excited about that. We're talking about uh, $53 million in the governor's proposed budget for new faculty members in the uh, state operated campuses and community colleges, more money for EOCs, more money for EOP. Um, uh, filling the tap gap um, and a variety of other things that will really uh, benefit SUNY and, and, and our students um, as, as well. So we're really excited about that. In response to that, um, what Chancellor um, Stanley has done is convened a group of uh, uh, teams um, putting together, I think, uh, hang on a second, I'm going through some materials here. Um, we've got um, a, basically a, a timeline. We've got uh, five teams that are coming together um, to basically look at uh, alignment of what we um, we can do to support the governor's uh, state of the state message and what um, she would like to accomplish within the university. Um, so there is a group that has been created um, to look at the governor's statements regarding research and innovation. Um, that group is composed of people in the system office and uh, campus representatives as well, campus presidents. Um, research and innovation is one area. Uh, path to economic success is another area. Increase access, which is enrollment and financial aid, and transformation and partnerships. So my apologies, there are only four groups. Um, Kim and I are sitting in uh, groups um, supporting those efforts, and we will keep you updated as things advance. But the, um, the goal is to basically uh, get our thoughts down in terms of what we think it will take um, to meet the governor's objectives, um, have that ready by the end of the calendar year so that it can be presented to leadership at the state level um, going into next budget year for even additional funding. So we're, we're really excited about the possibilities going forward um, and think that now is gonna be a, a really great time to, um, uh, to uh, be in the university and to make sure that we're all communicating with each other so that we can see that um, you know, see that we, we, we move forward. What we're, what we're, what I think back to is really good at is um, communicating, you know, across all the campuses and really encourage you as the fact to representatives. We all know presidents and provosts get communication um, from the system office about strategic directions. We don't think that always trickles down the way it should. So what we wanna do is use the fact to campus representatives as the way to push that information up um, so that it goes across all the campuses and whatever we can do to support you in, in that, we will try and do to the best of our ability. Obviously situations on campus vary, um, but we wanna do is make sure you've got information about what the uh, strategic objectives of the, the university are, 
but you can align those with your strategic directions on campus and really help move, advance the goals uh, that we all have. Um, I'm going to put the, uh, I saw that uh, Megan put, uh, asked a question about those uh, groups, and I will put those, uh, I'll, I'll pop something in the chat um, so you can see what that is. Any questions or comments? Okay. Thank you all. And Carrie reminded me that I normally put up a slide listing the responsibilities of FAC2 reps, but I forgot to do it this time. And the main responsibilities are, as Carrie suggested, sharing information out to your campuses and also gathering information from your campuses and channeling it back. And we'll provide opportunities for that throughout the year. And we'll talk about some ways later in the session about how we'd like to improve some of those communications. And Kerry has put the um, those four goals in the chat. So it's our actually, next- It's actually five, John, I'm sorry. Oh, five, okay, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, it's increased by 20%, 25%. Um, so um, our next uh, presenter is Kim Scalzo, who will be talking about what's happening with SUNY online education. And I think there may be a few things going on there. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's great to see everybody. Um, uh, um, uh, I do have a little bit of a slide deck, but, but that's really focused on the DLE. And so before I jump into that, just to say um, a lot, I think, going on in the enrollment space, both for us on the degrees at scale side, as well as in thinking through in some of those areas that Carrie just talked about, uh, how what we're doing in online supports some of those initiatives. So I'll just point to, I'm serving on the focus on equity group and uh, a lot of the conversations in that group are on how we reach um, populations that we want to serve um, in higher numbers and percentages. And so there's some initiatives around um, prison education, um, around connecting more with the EOCs, um, uh, around um, uh, some of our campuses, um, that are designated as minority serving institutions or close to that mark where maybe they, they could um, be eligible for that designation. Um, so I think it's been really interesting to see this framework of the state of the state uh, and how through the lens of what the governor outlined, we all think about what we're doing and what we could be doing to strengthen um, SUNY's position in some of these areas. So, um, so a lot happening there. On the degrees at scale side, um, we are um, continuing to look at what we're doing on the recruitment side, uh, continuing to um, refine the approaches for digital advertising and for analysis of what happens to those inquiries that come in and how they convert to applicants and enrolled students. So um, uh, we're three years into that now and we have a fair bit of data um, that we're looking at. I just looked at uh, the number of, um, of applications that we've brought in over the last three years and um, was interesting to see that, that while we're generating applications for the programs in that initiative, about 10% of our applications uh, actually are going to campuses for programs outside of the degrees at scale. So that's you know not insignificant and something that we're continuing to closely monitor. Um, on the degrees at scale, I'm sorry, on the digital learning environment, let me just um, bring up my slides uh, and see, is everybody seeing um, the deck? Okay, and if you were in the FACT Council meeting last week, this is going to look very familiar to you, um, but uh, I want to make sure that everybody's getting the update. So. We are, as you all know, we are um, implementing um, Brightspace as our new digital learning environment. We have uh, campuses uh, have organized themselves into four cohorts. Um, I should say we outlined the four cohorts and everybody selected into the cohorts they wanted to be in. The first cohort has already kicked off. That is the biggest cohort with 30 campuses. I know many of you are on the call right now. So you're in kind of that, um, you know, uh, um, in the throes of, completing the academic planning and prep and getting ready to launch your pilot for the summer. Cohorts two, three, and four will kick off um, uh, in um, the, um, uh, actually cohort two will kick off uh, next month, cohort three in the fall and cohort four next January. So 
Um, uh, so in the in the throes of that right now, um, and campuses are are working with the D2L teams and with our team on getting their local system set up, their local tenants set up, getting training done for their folks, and um, and again getting ready to launch their their pilot. We have a group that's working on a suite of templates. Uh, and so this is a little bit of a status update of where we are with the various templates. Uh, so the migration, the asynchronous and the synchronous templates are um, completed as well as the face-to-face. -face. Uh, hybrid and high flex are in process and will be delivered later this month. Um, and as a reminder, a template is, um, you know, a kind of um, a starting point for faculty, for campuses to think about. The idea is that campuses and faculty will take what, what we are providing as a starting point and adapt and use as it makes sense at the campus level or for individual courses. Uh, so that has been um, a pretty uh, busy activity uh, since the start of this semester and, um, uh, and that's where that group is. Training is another significant initiative. And uh, so, uh, as I mentioned, training has already begun. There are a couple of activities happening. Um, we've started the delivery of the um, uh, asynchronous and synchronous uh, training. Um, and uh, if you're not aware, um, so the, the, the URL at the bottom left, dle.suny.edu training, will give you everything you need to know about what's happening with training. Um, there are these also these fireside chats that Jamie Heron is hosting um, that are very topical. Uh, and so, and, and folks can actually suggest topics via the s'mores document. So um, a lot of training happening. The idea is that we're providing options for campuses. Uh, if you wanna deliver your own training, you have access to our materials. If you are participating in our training, um, uh, you know, there are lots of options for, for a faculty. The question that I always get is if my campus requires training um, and somebody participates in your training, how do I know if they completed it? And that's where um, these cert certificate is available. Uh, and uh, in the various scenarios that are outlined, you can see where there are required assessments that will result in a certificate. Um, okay, the next thing I want to say about training is, and I think this is just brilliant, is that uh, um, the team worked on a questionnaire that faculty can complete to self-assess the training that is most uh, well-matched to what they need. So, uh, um, so they answer these questions about technology, their previous experience, and kind of how quickly um, they want to be able to be, be um, ready to go. And based on their responses to those questions, um, they get a level of spark, ignite, blaze, or bonfire, um, which you know um, will then recommend to them the configuration of training um, activities that will best address their needs. And I got an update from Jamie earlier this week that um, you know, based on what she's seeing in terms of folks participating in the training, um, that seems to be um, working well, and folks are getting the level of training that they're that they feel like they should be getting. So. Um, uh, any other feedback on that, of course, is always welcome, but um, early indications on that are positive. We do know that the initial emphasis has been on the faculty who are prepping for the pilot this summer, who may tend to be early adopters, but um, again, we're going to continue to monitor that and look for feedback. So Chilton, I think on the website are the descriptions of all of those. I actually... Um, pasted it in my talking points here, but um, uh, I can share that, but it is, um, I believe it's on the website. Um, so if you don't see it there, let me know, but I believe that's where it is. Um, okay, let me keep going. Um, so um, the next thing that I wanna talk about is, um, you know, what does this look like from a student and faculty experience perspective? So. At the global level, um, the URL for getting into Brightspace is mylearning.suny.edu. Our expectation is that campuses will come up with their own campus-specific URL that you will point students to. So that gives you your own branding opportunity, um, not the only branding opportunity, but one of. And that when students go to the campus URL, um, you know, and, and that's where they will authenticate. And um, as soon as they get into Brightspace, they will actually come to mylearning.suny.edu. They don't have to know that. You don't have to worry about that. 
that will happen in the way that authentication and um, access to the system is provided. But what that means is that because everybody is um, coming into the system, both faculty and students with what we're calling the SUNY Global ID, if I am a student taking uh, courses on multiple campuses, I will see all of my courses um, together. I won't have to log in and out from campus to campus to see um, my courses across multiple campuses. So that's a really big piece of what we were trying to go for in improving the student experience with this implementation. And, um, um, and we're really pleased to, to um, be able to provide that for students. So um, if anyone has questions on this, I'm happy to, um, to answer them, but wanted you all to have that picture. Um, the next thing that I want to make sure everyone is aware of is that, um, you know, there we've, we've been talking about this throughout the project. Early on, we identified a set of policy standards and guidance at the SUNY level that we we're going to try to align with. And there are specific activities, um, whether it be with the templates or the training or the way we're doing authentication, uh, the, you know, the way that we're um, creating accounts. Um, that we are aligning with all the policies that are listed here that we're really excited about. So for those of you at the campus level who may be involved in some local campus efforts around compliance with any of these policies, standards, or guidance, know that we are supporting you in this initiative. And if you want specific um, uh, information on that, please let me know. Oh, thank you for whoever put those descriptions in the chat. Um, uh, I, you know, we're going to be sharing more about exactly what we're doing in each area um, uh, as we go forward. Um, but I just wanted to remind everybody about that piece of this project. It's not just about getting the platform out there, but making sure that as we are designing it and, um, and executing the implementation, we have all of these pieces in mind. Um, and that's it. And I'm going to stop sharing so I can see everybody and see if there's any other questions. And I think I stayed within my time, John. You're muted. Yes, thank you, Kim. Any questions about any of the many things that Kim reported on? Okay, well, the next topic on the agenda is CIT, which will be here in Oswego coming up very soon. And I hope we'll see everyone here. One of the things we'll be doing is having a fact two meeting there, but Nancy will give us more detail on where we are with CIT. Okay, can everyone see that? Yes. My screen. Okay, so CIT 2022, May 31st to uh, June 3rd. It is our 30th anniversary. Um, the theme, uh, for those of you have, who haven't seen that yet, sustaining the momentum, building on what we've learned. Um, we have the five tracks, building an inclusive campus, creating an inclusive classroom, educational technologies for engagement, pedagogically speaking, and effective sharing methods. Um, some of the details. So it's going to be a hybrid event. Our virtual CIT, um, there will be 19 sessions that are scheduled between Wednesday and Friday. So um, anyone that is attending virtually would just have access to those 19 sessions, as well as our three general sessions. So the, uh, the provost and the chancellor on uh, Wednesday for our welcome, keynotes, uh, VG Sathy and Kelly Hogan on Thursday, and our closing, Kevin Gannon on Friday. And then we'll have um, some virtual vendor exhibits as well. Um, in person, we're so happy CIT is back. Um, pretty much a typical CIT for those of you who have uh, been there in the past. We have our Tuesday workshops. Um, those are an additional charge. Um, we'll have a, a welcome reception. We actually have a couple of um, sessions in the planetarium that evening as well that they've agreed to do. Um, those folks for uh, in-person attendees would have access to all the sessions. And that does include the virtual sessions. We're going to have a couple classrooms set up where folks can go in if there's a virtual session they're interested in instead. They can go in and view that um, on a larger screen. Or of course, you can do it through your mobile app. So whichever you prefer, you can go ahead with. Um, We'll have our poster sessions, technology showcase, and of course, um, what everyone likes about CIT is the networking. Um, 
uh, keynote and closing speakers again it's VG Sathy and Kelly Hogan on Thursday um, their uh, keynote is strategies for promoting equity in the college classroom and our closing on Friday is Kevin Gannon a pedagogy of hope during the time of monsters uh, so far our conference sponsors D12 is our platinum uh, K16 Solutions is our gold sponsor, and our silver are um, ACUE, Apple, BibliU, Class Technologies, and HonorLock. We have Simple Syllabus for our bronze sponsor, and exhibitors so far are Carolina Biological, Extron, and Labster. Uh, a couple of our special events, we'll have our FACT2 Awards presentation on Wednesday around 1130. Um, and then for all of you, um, anyone on the FACT Council and uh, FACT Campus Rep, we have the luncheon on Wednesday, June 1st at 1145. For anyone who is a first time uh, CIT attendee, we are offering the Sharon Gallagher Scholarship. I know last year we, we offered a number of them because the um, the registration for CIT being virtual was much lower, but it'll be just one scholarship this year. Um, but it does cover your entire registration fee and on campus housing if you choose to stay on campus. There is also, um, once again, we're offering the opportunity to be published. Um, you must submit your, your full paper by July 1st and um, selections will be made by the 15th. And you can find more information on the CIT website on that. And for more information on the conference and to register, you can go to the CIT website. Any questions? There's a question in the chat, Nancy. Will the FACT2 campus reps meeting have a Zoom component for folks who cannot attend in person? Yes. Um, yes, we are <laughs> looking to do that. Yeah. I'll set up a Zoom session and share it with everyone because that, we didn't want to put it in the official schedule because then it would be shared with everyone who were not back to members. So, right. Any other questions for Nancy? Okay. Be sure to get your registrations in early so you can take advantage of the early bird price. And it will be good to get back together again after a few yes, years of it will. This is our third I know this is <laughs> Sonia, yes, we, we go. Take three. <laughs> and it's Nancy, when is the early bird registration good through? Or when does um, that stop? It May 1st. Thank you. You're welcome. We've had some task groups that have been busily working for the last few years and some that one that just started up this year. Uh, we have a presentation by the first group of uh, innovations and assessment, which is now completing its second year of work and running a symposium that they'll be talking about. And we have Chilton Reynolds and Nicole Simon who will who have co chaired that and we'll talk about their work. Yeah, so thanks, John, for letting us have time to do this today. Um, hi, my name is Chilton Reynolds. I'm from SUNY Oneonta. Uh, I'm one of the co-chairs of this, along with Nicole Simon from Nassau Community College. Um, as John said, we've been working on this for the past two years. We are coming to towards the ends of our work on this, but we have a couple of really exciting things coming up in the next couple months that we want to share with you um, as well. So just to kind of give you a little bit of background of where we have been, um, these were kind of the founding principles of what we were doing, where we were really looking at in-classroom assessments of student learning um, and really trying to find innovative ways to be able to do that to help to have better learning in the classroom. Um, this is our charge. Again, we'll, we'll share this with you just so you have some idea of the scope of what we have been doing over the past two years of really focusing on collecting innovative assessment practices to be able to share out with a larger student community. Um, so to do that, um, we had divided up into four subgroups that really looked at four specific areas around this, um, everything from multiple pathways to real uh, world assessments, to social justice assessments, to learning recognition. Um, and really have four groups have been very active over the past two years to try to collect a lot of examples of this. The, one of the main things that we did was to create a website 
um, which we have been using to collect lots of both examples and research and resources around these four areas. So we have um, kind of subsites inside of here for each one of these uh, subgroups that we have been working on. And we have been using this to collect that information and also to allow um, everyone else to be able to share things that they would like to as well. So at the very top of that uh, website, we have a place where you can submit your own ideas as well or your own assessment strategies you think that would fit for us. Um, our group has been vetting those and then making sure they're clean um, for putting into our website. So uh, we have been collecting those and would love to continue to collect these. So please feel free to share this, uh, this link. Nicole just put that into the chat. Um, with anybody who you feel like has good assessment ideas that they have been using in the classroom, we would love to collect those um, to share on the site. So this link is where you can go to do that. You would click on the submit your assessment. It goes to a Google form currently where you can fill in that information. And we've been looking at it and just kind of cleaning it up to put it onto the website so it all presents in a um, kind of unified way. Um, our goal is to continue this as a repository and a resource after um, our work is done at the end of this um, school year so that it can be something that continues to grow and continues to be um, good for um, coming years. And you can come to use this both as a place to share things, but also if you're looking for resources or information, you can do that as well. Um, one of our big culminations has been to starting actually tomorrow, um, we are doing four weeks of webinars as our symposium around this. Um, each week will be one of our subgroups. We're starting tomorrow with the multiple pathways group, uh, and then we'll be going for the next four Thursdays with those webinars. We are going to be recording all of those and sharing them back out to the website that we had put out. If you have not yet registered or are interested in registering for this, the link is in the chat now. Nicole just put that one in as well. Um, so that you can share that out with your campus. We've put out lots of uh, emails to uh, the rep. So hopefully you've seen those emails come out already. In addition, we uh, put everything, we're putting it into Workplace and are now putting it into Yammer. So you should have access to it there as well. Please feel free to um, share that. It is completely free to attend these um, and be able to be a part of those. So the schedule for those are, again, as, you, as we said, um, tomorrow we are starting with the first one. Um, and then every Thursday from there, we'll be doing real world uh, next Thursday. The Thursday after that will be socially just assessments. And then the final one will be um, classroom learning recognition uh, on the Thursday after that. In addition, for the month of May, we're going to be doing a four week assessment challenge. Anyone who signs up for any of the webinars will automatically be included in this. This is not something you have to do, but just something we want to give out there. If you want to have a structured way to kind of think of some ways to rethink assess assessment in your own classroom, then you can use that four week challenge to kind of go through the process. We'll do a weekly update where we're ask you to think about some things and then post your work um, back to a place so we can kind of help support people through that who want to. Um, all of this, our, our goal then is to culminate with CIT, where we will be uh, presenting both on some uh, outputs from the symposium, as well as hopefully some other people that have been uh, participating in those four week assessment challenges um, to be able to share out some ways that that's, that has happened. Um, and with that, uh, I will say thank you um, and see if there's any questions from anybody. So uh, that is where we are with our group. It's been a, a great group that we've been working on for the past two years and look forward to finishing the group as a work as a whole. And then see, as you can see, continue to use some of these resources um, for SUNY moving forward beyond that. Thank you. Any questions? And please share information about the webinars again with your campuses to the extent you're able to. Um, we'd like to see as many people, this group's done a lot of work on organizing this and it would be good to see as many people as possible attending and benefiting from this work. Um, if I can just make a quick comment. Uh, Nicole and Chilton have done an awesome job on this for the past two years. It's been a ton of work and they've been 
fearless leaders and have gone above and beyond. And I really appreciate all the work they've done. And I'd like to just say thank you and applaud you for your efforts. It's really appreciated. Thank you. And our next task group was on the P, plus, uh, P through 20, uh, P through 20 plus educational continuum, which is co-chaired by Nancy Travers and Anne Reed. I don't see them on, John. I don't either. Is anyone from their group willing to anyone share with group? them or should we move on? Is anyone? Um... No, I know we're a little bit early, so I don't know if maybe they were just going to pop in to That's do the possible. presentation. Okay, well, we can move to our newest task group, which just began this year um, on inclusive teaching with. Um, Carlos Jones and Audi Matias. Or Carlos and- I don't see them either. Okay, well, then we can move a little bit further forward. Um, one of the things that we've been working on this year, we'll come back um, if, if they're able to come in a bit later. Um, we put a group together to talk about ways of improving communication. And I'd like to welcome Judy Littlejohn, who will be taking over, by the way, as fact to chair as of the end of CIT. So welcome, Judy. Thanks. Um, so we do have a small group that we're, um, we're kind of focused on increasing ways for fact to reps can engage with the, the committee as a whole. And um, obviously the webinars, are a great way to communicate and we um they're not new but we will continue those in the future and in the fall after the webinar we sent out a newsletter for everyone to share on their campus and we do plan to continue that practice so after today's webinar we'll be putting together the newsletter for everyone to share on their campus um, we're also trying to work closely, more closely with the task groups to ensure that the fact two reps are the go-to people to disseminate information about the task groups to try to um, help um, recruit <laughs> task group members and to share surveys and any other types of information gathering processes. Like you'd be the first layer that we go to before we start to reach out to other groups. And I'd love to see our own, um, uh, oh my gosh, my brain. Okay, our own, uh, our campus reps, even as um, heads of the task groups too, or co-chairs at least. So we'll look for that in the fall as we come up with some new group ideas. And um, I think that's about it. We just wanna try to work more toward keeping the channels of communication open and um, just try to, try to keep, keep pressing forward. But we do appreciate everything everybody does and wanna make sure that um, if you have any questions or um, any ideas to share that you feel comfortable sharing them with us. So does anybody have any questions? Thanks Robin for that comment. <laughs> I'm not sure what I've gotten myself into here. <laughs> I don't have yes, to do. June. <laughs> and, and again, they, this group put together a wonderful newsletter next time, and it should be a good way of transmitting information. And we'll include it in there will be links to the slides and any videos and so forth from this, as well as any other things that are going on with the council. Um, so thank you. It's been a very productive group. Our next topic are, is the FACT2 Awards, and uh, Janet Nepke will be presenting on that, who has been sharing this since she created these awards. Yeah, thanks for that, that look at history, John. <laughs> um, so we are the FACT2 Awards Committee, which consists of several people who review nominations that come in. This is the rather squished together list of the current review committee. Um, they work very hard 
And we are very well supported by CPD with regard to the technology used for the um, incoming nominations. What uh, can we have the next slide, please? These are the six awards or the three categories, if you wish, or the four categories, if you wish to look at it. We have excellence in instruction for both community colleges and state ops. We have excellence in instructional support. And we're proud of the fact that we're one of the, we were one of the early adopters of the notion of having an award for um, instructional support, uh, noting that they work as a very strong team with faculty member. And then just more recently, we established new awards in administrative leadership because we all know how helpful it can be when you have an administrator who is aware of the importance of using technology to improve education. You know that there are some people who can make your day better as you're trying to instruct and support using technology. So we wanted to recognize those people too. You'll notice that each award, each award please, is available for community colleges and then also for state ops. And because we understand um, from being told by our campus reps that the operations at those different colleges are quite different and the availability of resources can be different too. So we've tried to take all of that into account. Is there another slide, Nancy? Um, I'm really excited to tell you that the review committee has done its work. They have made nominations and we have reported those with Carrie Hatch's help to the provost in charge. Um, the provost or provost in charge must approve the nominations that have been made. And we're expecting that to happen momentarily. So this is going to be an exciting week or at least early next week when we make the announcements of the award winners. I can tell you that the nominations were quite extraordinary by the quality of people that did that. And as a last word, I'd like to say, please, that we really believe in these awards, both to recognize people of accomplishment, but also to try to promote the notion that we can improve education through the intelligent and selective use of technology. Um, and we, in one of FACT2's most basic goals is to share information of this sort. So we will be honoring people who are superlative in their use of technology to improve education. But we are also looking to share all of the innovations which our award winners have created or used or changed. The, what I'm hoping our campus reps will do is to spread the word that nominations, um, that the call from the provost office will come out probably in September for new nominations. And so right now, is the time to be looking around your campus and encouraging the people on your campus to look around for people whom they think offers superlative service to better education through the support of, of technology. Please think about who might be an award winner. This is a very important award that comes to the attention of your campus administration. So look around now and when you're talking to people and say, boy, that person is really helpful or gee that person has really improved what we're doing on our campus think about perhaps that should be a nominee for next year um you have my contact information there if you have questions or if there are questions now i'd be glad to answer them okay john thanks for the opportunity thank you any questions for john Okay, well, next, uh, Chris Price will talk a bit about the, the new variant of IATG awards for this year. Interesting choice of words, John. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> the right, so, uh, in the Delta. chat, uh, putting two links in the chat uh, to these two IATG funded projects that we just announced uh, in the last week or so. So, uh, as you all probably are aware the Innovative Instruction Technology Grant Program has been um, going on since uh, early uh, 2011, I believe. And so there were uh, eight rounds of the program. Uh, my colleague, Lisa Stevens from UB and also who works uh, with us at System Administration uh, was a, a very capable steward of that program for, for many years. Uh, a couple of years ago, it was transitioned to for administrative oversight to the Center for Professional Development. 
uh, shadowed Lisa for a year and then the pandemic hit. So the last year we had an open call was in, um, was supposed to be for the 2021 academic year and uh, the pandemic uh, put a pause in the program. So all, any, anyone who applied for that academic year, uh, you know, unfortunately was not funded. Uh, and we learned uh, later in the fall of this uh, academic year that we did have some funding uh, as part of the program. Unfortunately, it was too late to put out an open call. And so uh, what we decided to do was to look at some strategic priorities uh, throughout SUNY, uh, especially around enrollment and um, to incentivize faculty to uh, utilize tools, tech tools effectively to um, teach both large classes and high flex courses, right? So large classes, the effect on enrollment is pretty clear there. Uh, for high flex classes, you know, that was obviously a strategy utilized during the pandemic to provide flexibility for students to attend a course in the modality that was uh, best for them. And so uh, the purpose of both of these uh, calls for proposals is for faculty to experiment with a tool that enables uh, either a large them to teach a large course or to teach a high flex course. Uh, and so there's some uh, funding available for folks. So the high flex course uh, project, you know, they're, they're going to, it's, since it's a whole course, um, the, the level of funding for that is a little bit higher for faculty and that's to compensate them for time spent this summer uh, in training, both pedagogical training and technical training to learn how to use the tool effectively in their course. Uh, and same for the large courses uh, project, uh, because you know, the tool they'll be using for that is not, it's not a comprehensive course design kind of project. Uh, the time they'll spend in the summer training is a little bit uh, less for the large courses project. So right now um, you could check out the calls there for the details. Um, right now, the, the deadline for both projects is uh, April 25th. So um, about three weeks or so. And, uh, you know, and then we'll let folks know by May 6th. You'll notice in the large classes call that we haven't actually listed the tools that we'll be funding for faculty to utilize. Um, and that was kind of, uh, uh, we initially thought we would put tools out there for them to select, but instead there's a number of categories on the uh, application that kind of describes the, the, the pain points of teaching a large course and you know, how tools might help meet those pain points. So you can imagine what those would be. Uh, grading, assessment, facilitating team-based learning in large classes. Uh, and so that's just some of the ones that well, we're asking folks to indicate what they're trying to do first in their course. And then after they are accepted into the project, we'll uh, discuss their options for tools. You know, there was a committee that met for about three, month, three times over February that uh, brainstormed tools and you know, and talked about this project and some of those folks are actually up here today. Uh, John was on that committee. So um, anyway, uh, I'll stop there uh, and just see if you have any questions. Hi, Chris, it's Lauren. Um, is this the document you'd like us to share with faculty or are we routing them to a website or the, doc, the Google Doc is what we're sharing? Those two Google Docs, yes. Those are the okay. ones that went out from the provost and there are links to the application forms on those Google Docs, yeah. And that's actually, you know, I just realized those links are not on the IATG site right now. The IATG site's under construction. So, um, you know, we're, you know, we kind of put that in the back burner until we have an open call again. But so, yeah, the Google Docs, or that's went out, those are what went out from the provost uh, last week to all the uh, vice presidents for academic affairs to the other provost. Uh, so that answers Megan's question. Dave. Uh, thanks, Chris. I just have a question because I was looking over at the, uh, the HyFlex IATG grant and is there funding available for hardware because that, for example, uh, sound systems to make HyFlex work effectively in a classroom is really critical and that's the main thing that's holding back at least our college. Yeah, I know Dave, you heard you say that in other meetings. Um, unfortunately, no. Uh, you know, the idea is we want to learn uh, whether or not, you know, because this software, you know, for example, Engagely, you know, they make a lot of promises around utilizing this software tool uh, in a wide variety of environments. 
So, you know, we want to figure out, okay, is that really true? Okay, so, you know, theoretically, at least these tools should be able to be utilized in a wide variety of classrooms with wide varieties of technology. And so uh, we're only going to fund the tool itself if folks need it. And like I said, we'll pay for training and, and that sort of thing. Uh, another question, can I follow up on that quickly? Yeah. Um, there's different tiers. For example, if you had a tier two or tier three where your college pitches in for uh, part of a matching part of the grant, could that money be used for the hardware? So we're not using the same funding structure for this, Dave. I mean, we, because we've already kind of decided what's being funded. So really um, the only commitment we ask, well, there are a couple of things. For the high flex project, it has to be listed as a high flex course uh, in, in, in Cirrus. So it needs to be reported in that modality. It can't be a um, other type of what, uh, flexible course. So I know some campuses allow for students to attend synchronously online or face-to-face, -face, but they don't have the asynchronous component, those classes are not eligible for this project. It has to be listed officially as a high flex course. Um, and so, and that's it. I mean, and then obviously the campus has to be made aware uh, uh, that you're in, being involved and give their sign off. So um, there's a question on the sign up form, which asks the applicants to consult with uh, relevant uh, tech staff on their campus to just get permission or, or at least let them know that they're attending on applying so that the campus is brought into the loop. Same thing for the large class project, right? We want folks to consult with the tech uh, folks on their campus so that they're aware that they're applying for this project and that there'll be some collaboration and they're not picking a tool. So we also want at that stage when they pick the tool, we'll want that dialogue to happen as well. We don't want folks going uh, behind the back of folks who support technology, classroom technology and on the campus to do something that is gonna be problematic on their campus. But we'll work with all the folks who are involved to do that. Beyond that, that's what we're asking from campuses. We're not uh, asking for any kind of match or anything like that. Of course, we'd like campuses to invest in these things. So, you know, um, and I know of at least one campus where the HyFlex call came out, maybe pushed the discussion around utilizing HyFlex courses uh, more. And they're gonna, I think that campus will probably be uh, uh, expediting the process of approving that modality. Yes, Dave, we're using SUNY's definition of high flex, which I certainly, uh, it's, it's linked to on the, the call. So at the very uh, top of that Google Doc I shared is a link to the SUNY policy. Hey, any questions for Chris? Any other questions for Chris? Yeah, and, and you know, John, I am on those other two fat task groups. <laughs> uh, so I don't know I mean, if, if no one else has showed up, I could. Well, you know, Carlos <laughs> is here. So uh, Carlos, could you give us, a, now that we're back to the time when we were scheduled, could you give a present presentation on the status of the inclusive teaching task group? Yes, I can. Everybody can hear me okay. I'm, I hope. Yes. Great, wonderful. So the uh, inclusive teaching task group is working. We are currently in the stage of, we've uh, divided it up into two slash three uh, task uh, subgroups that are working on gathering information around inclusive teaching. Currently we are pulling together uh, documentation that supports that um, the theory and the idea and the concept around it. And then we're also cre uh, collecting um, information around the practice of it, how, how it's done and some examples. The idea is to pull all that together. We'll be reporting out uh, on it and what we found um, at the CIT. And then moving forward into the next phase from that, um, coming up with a curated list and a, a repository of some sorts very much simpler to the, uh, what the assessment task group did last year that can provide information to faculty on how to get to best teaching practices, if you will, curated examples and such. So that is where we are. That is what we're doing. We are hoping to do that list surrounded by what is happening currently within SUNY, not across the company, but specifically SUNY. And so 
at that time, we hope to solicit information from campuses, uh, people to submit their great, wonderful ideas that they're doing. Um, so we will reach out to the, uh, the reps. And if you can get that to people on your campus to give us all the great, wonderful things they're doing around inclusive teaching, when we put that call out, that would be very helpful. I think that's all I have. Thank you. Any questions for Carlos about this group? Okay, Chris, we can take you up on that offer to fill us in on the P20 plus um, pathway group. So Lisa Stevens is also on the task group. And, and <laughs> so she said, since you all just heard a lot from me, I asked her if she would start it <laughs> and I <laughs> compliment all the brilliant things she's about to tell you. Yeah, well, our task group is is co-chaired by Ann Reed and Nan Travers. And it was launched when our former governor and former chancellor <laughs> were very interested in um, uh, <clears throat> the P through 20 continuum. And in particular, looking at how workforce issues fit into all of that. Uh, Meg Benke was sitting on that statewide council as well. So out of that, we thought, gee, it'd be good to have a, a good investigation of what we're doing SUNY wide to see if we could coordinate more efforts there. And it's essentially looking at the continuum, what various campuses are doing to outreach <clears throat> into say- could you try again? I wasn't talking to you. Okay. <laughs> to see if we can um, look at how high school students are being, you know, invited and funneled into various um, campus programs, things of that nature. Also taking a look at the universal ID that we can potentially leverage, you know, SUNY wide ID see how we can be more unified in that. Chris, that's what I'm remembering off the top of my head from our last meeting is the highlights. I don't have notes in front of me. Do you, what are your recollections? Yeah, I was actually just going back to my notes that I took for our meeting last week and I think you hit on it. I mean, essentially this task group was to kind of think about how can we conceptualize all of education, right? Uh, you know, P through 20 and not just sort of formal education in the high schools and universities and colleges, but also uh, continuing education, uh, professional development. I mean, that's what kind of got me interested in that um, task group, just because I was in, I've been involved in projects in Ro in Rochester area, connecting um, uh, teachers in the K through 12 districts here with uh, faculty in the colleges, and you know, so I just I think you know what the outcome of this is: how can technology do a better job, how uh, can we utilize technology to do a better job of making connections between the various types of educational um, paths that folks take. Um, and Nan Travers, who's co-chairing, uh, is um, does a lot of work in this area uh, and a lot of research in this area. And so at our last meeting, she, she started to pull together a kind of uh, conceptual framework for what we're gonna do, which we'll probably present at uh, CIT. So stay tuned. Okay, any questions about this task group? This group will be finishing its work and the only continuing group will be the inclusive um, teaching task group. And there will be a new one that will be formed and we're hoping that'll be together by this, at least the general framework of that will be together by CIT and there'll be a call for participants at that point. So um, now we're way ahead of schedule and I have put together in case we did have time, a, uh, a jam board to try to get some feedback from everyone on what's happening on your campuses. Um, so there's three questions on that. Um, and let me share my screen for just a second and um, find that jam board. There, there it is, okay. And um, the first question, well, the, Actually, the first question is, what could the council do to improve communications and to assist you in your role as a campus rep? The next page um, asks you, 
What are some of the major challenges that you're facing on your campus in general concerning teaching and learning and teaching with technology? And the third question is what types of um, what types of things are occurring on your campuses related to teaching and learning with technology that you'd like to share with this larger group? So um, all you need to do is just click on this little thing here, a sticky note, and just put some notes up about what's happening on your campus. And the notes are anonymous, so feel free to um, put your name in. If it's, some, if it's something you'd like to share in terms of what's happening on the campus, please include the name of your campus. I do see a comment about two reps per campus. Right now, there are two reps per campus. One is supposed to be a faculty representative and the other is supposed to be support. So each campus should have two reps right now. Not every campus does, but a call for that goes out every fall to the chief academic officers. A little bit of background on, on Workplace versus Yammer. Um, workplace will be shutting down fairly soon. So Yammer is designed primarily to replace that, but there will still be probably both email and Yammer, I, I imagine going forward. I need my Apple pencil. <laughs> <laughs> Something about learning management systems. We need to know which campus is doing that. <laughs> I see somebody wants major amounts of training on Yammer. And I think I would imagine SUNY will be providing that once more things are shifted over there. And getting the bugs worked out for Yama 
would be helpful. Um, we had hoped a few years ago that everything would move to workplace and that would work smoothly. And we were planning to completely drop using email, but the problem was it wasn't getting to everybody. So um, maybe I'm hoping that Yammer, I think we're all hoping that perhaps one place will be selected and Yammer is what that currently is designated to be. And if everyone uses it, it becomes, could become really effective. I see somebody's interested in a journal club, um, reading and discussing a different scholarship of teaching and learning paper each month. That's an interesting idea. Yeah, that's us at ESF. We piloted that this semester is our, when our book club didn't quite take off. So we also viewed it as sort of a lower stakes. <laughs> you know, if you, if you can't make one, you can make another one. And, trying to pick papers that'll appeal to sort of different faculty, like some more like disciplinary specific stuff. That's a nice idea. Thank you. On his first page, one of the things that has often come up is that fact two reps do not always have a way of sharing information on their campuses. And that's something that unfortunately has to be worked out at the campus level. We don't have a central way of doing that. But one thing that did happen this fall is that the letter that goes to the CAOs has requested that the fact two reps have some way of disseminating information. So that is listed as part of the condition or the conditions of appointment. So um, there's at least a little bit of a nudging to the campuses to provide a mechanism for that. But, um, but that is a challenge because the reps have very different roles and um, some people have really convenient communications but others find it more difficult. Some things that people have suggested is if you could find a, a place to report to, um, to a faculty assembly or faculty senate on your campus, that might be one way of doing it. If there's a teaching and learning center that has communication, if you could share information with them that they could forward, or often there is some mechanism where the administration will share notes. Um, you know, if you could look into options of sharing reports, newsletters, or or at least information about things like the workshop series that's coming up. Um, if that could be disseminated through one of the existing channels, that can sometimes work. It's easiest if you have your own communication channel, but a lot of fact two reps have reported that problem for years. And an orientation for new reps, that's a really good idea. And that's 
actually very closely aligned with some things that that committee that Judy is sharing, uh, Judy um, has helped organize, um, has talked about doing something for this. So while you're still posting something, let's let's talk about some of these. Turn you know, turn your mic on. Um, more opportunities for fact two reps to collaborate is a great idea, and it could help build a better community. What would be some ways to do that that would be helpful? Any suggestions on how to do that? I, I feel like you already have a lot of that because there's so many different work groups and task force forces and stuff like I haven't been to one of these in a long time I'm here for Diana Voss today, but like I know all of you guys so I know that there's like a social aspect um, that's already very present and I'm not sure if uh, there's anything else that needs to be done because this you guys uh, focus on so many different things that everybody has uh, at least something that they're passionate about and they want to be involved with. Well, we don't have all FACT2 reps so participating in the task groups. That is a one good way in which FACT2 rep could collaborate, but are there other ways where there could be some collaboration? One thing we've talked about at times in the past is perhaps having some regional gatherings where FACT2 reps might meet, you know, periodically in smaller groups. Um, just to talk about what's happening on their campus and share it within a smaller network. Um, or any suggestions on this? Well, I think that the article of the month suggestion that Brandon shared that they're doing on their campus is something that could be kind of um, expanded if people were interested in that type of interaction. Um, I don't know. I don't know if people if the interest is there or not, but um, you know, facilitating something like that could easily happen, mm -hmm. I think. Brandon, have you ever reached out to the authors and asked them to, you know, kind of participate as well remotely? Uh, not yet, Carrie, because like we just did, this is our first semester trying it out. Uh, and it's been sort of an interesting, you know, we're trying to keep things fairly current, although we've gone sure. into some some other uh some of the the disciplinary specific stuff has been interesting because it's also uncovered some interesting um some grad school models that we're also like going to try to pursue a little bit where there's phd students who are doing sort of a chapter of a dissertation that's actually like a, a little quasi experimental uh, instructional piece that relates to their topic of choice but is you know sort of contributing to the the teaching and learning of within their discipline. Um, but we haven't tried reaching out to an author yet. We're, this will just be our third one coming up next week. But I, I like the suggestion. Hmm. We're also kind of hoping to encourage faculty to think more about doing this kind of stuff. Like that was sort of the other driver since we are a research institution. It's a, getting people to think that these are, there are grant opportunities for this type of stuff. And there are also conferences to present at. Hi all, this is Mary Jo from Broadport. <laughs> um, our, our self, our teaching and learning group has been uh, uh, trying out a, a book club and very successfully this semester, which I never really anticipated. So uh, it sounds similar to what John was, was talking about, but um, they, they, they did um, Sitting Pretty, which is not a kind of book that you'd normally take as a, it wasn't an academic high um, chapter kind of thing. It was very, Accessible is the only word I could think of, but um, very readable is what I'm saying. And, and really, we had two sessions. We had to have multiple sessions of this because it was so popular. And we're hoping to get the, the um, author to come back to, to do a, some kind of an online uh, um, session with us maybe next year. Anyhow, I think there are, there are this is a tremendous opportunity. And, and I think both your teaching and learning centers, the FACT folks, but I also think the libraries could really play a role in pumping this up or getting some enthusiasm going on this. 
Is something like this, maybe a monthly article that's shared out for reading, is that something that might be worth doing across campuses with a larger group? Maybe with breakout rooms if, you know, if there's too many people showing up. Something maybe the CPD could take on. Uh, Chris was talking about looking at some options in a meeting yesterday. Would that be worthwhile or is that something that should would works better at the level of individual campuses? I don't know unless you try. <laughs> yeah, I think it's nice um, sometimes for people on individual campuses to have a chance to interact with and get to know or network with people on other campuses. It's hard, it can be difficult to find those opportunities. We get so caught up in what's going on every day and our teaching schedules, especially in a community college when you know your load's five and five, it's tough to you know, try to get out and network with people <clears throat> unless they're right in your own hallway sometimes. And at a small institution, it's tough to get like more of a critical mass anyway, <laughs> just between people's teaching schedules and especially if there's some more topical focus of papers, like the, the, the size dwindles pretty fast. Mm -hmm. A lot of good points here. And I think many campuses have seen that mass exodus of tech staff where the job market has improved quite a bit, but salaries on campuses haven't quite kept up. Workload is an issue that comes up a lot. Budget, budget communications. Um, high flex in professional development. High flex is challenging and it's, it's challenging for professional development as well. Um, but it's something that we could use to reach more of those people who aren't available at the same time. Um, so yeah, that's something we certainly need to work on, I think, on our, on our campuses, certainly on my campus. A lot of good points here. So the centralized teaching observation and peer mentoring program at UB, could someone tell us a little bit about that? I think Lauren post, oh, Lauren, you're still on. Yes, sorry, I um, lost my Zoom screen there for a second. Uh, we're currently partnering uh, the, the Office of Curriculum Assessment and Teaching Transformation, along with some champion faculty across campus to kind of develop our protocol and pilot both a teaching observation uh, program as well as a peer mentoring. So we're thinking it's kind of a two part um, and we're hoping to kind of kick this off in the fall semester. So if anyone has any suggestions, um, we've reviewed a lot of tools and kind of looked into what other schools are doing, but we haven't finalized our plan yet, but we're looking to pilot it, like I said, in the fall of 2022. Excellent. Okay, um, Megan had to leave, but Bright Space Playground sessions, we, we did some of those here and they were very popular with our faculty just easing the, the uh, comfort level a little bit for people who are were, who were really anxious about the move and just giving people a chance to play in bright space made it a whole lot easier for people to not worry quite as much about the transitions they're going to have to make later. Um, workshops on regular and substantive interaction, I suspect we're seeing a lot of those um, and those are needed. Um, Um, the program at SUNY Schenectady, could someone talk a little bit about that? 
Um, yeah, I actually started this in 2016. Uh, we have a music department, and many schools do. Um, what we did, well, what I kind of spearheaded was the idea that you can utilize the vocal students, the one vocalists, they're working on singing, but we realized they have an excellent sound stage and sound recording system uh, that students learn to utilize. So we get them to partner together, develop a script, uh, create it just like the professional environment where you have a project manager overseeing it and the students actually create the voiceover for educational videos that we create. So the students actually walk away with the experience of work experience of what it's like to create the assets that are used in advertising and they can put it on their resume. So instead of just saying that they're a singer, they walk away with an introduction to new fields. Uh, most of the students bold, they love it. They actually look forward to new scripts and the opportunity. And one of the professors worked the, uh, the scripts and the voiceover as an alternative assignment in his class. And most of the students usually opt for that. So we usually have competing scripts and the, the best voiceover wins when we use it. And then they get to use that video that's on YouTube to point to as something that they've done. So it's been pretty much of a success for how to create you know, assets for free. So any instructional designer who doesn't like the sound of their voice, right? You, you definitely can get other people of a good professional voiceover and that means a lot for video. And it also is nice as part of an e-portfolio for the students to share oh, yeah. when they're going to the job market. That's, that sounds like a really good plan. And I saw Chris posted something about, we did a workshop yesterday about um, a collaborative reading group between um, Oswego and Plattsburgh. And it's worked really well because we can share the tasks a little bit by having two colleges participate, we have the directors of the teaching center who can take run different sessions, allowing more sessions. Um, we've only done it with two institutions at this point. We have tried one as we go a while back, but we didn't have as much participation as the current one has. And it really has helped to share the burdens and to share the moderating tasks and also to provide a a greater variety of voices in the discussions because we get perspective from a wider range of disciplines and a wider range of institutional approaches this way. And it's been really, really positive. We've done, I think, four of them together now. and We're planning on doing another one in the fall. Okay, it looks like this is slowing down a little bit. Uh, we will share this with the FACT2 Council, and I'm hoping maybe we can share a link to it in the show notes. So if anyone who wasn't able to attend can still add to this as well as see what other people have suggested. So are there any topics that anyone would like to address? Okay, um, well, I'm trying to stop my sharing, but I seem to have lost the control to do that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I'm not entirely not sure why. why. Um, that is bizarre. Okay, well, in any case, um, thank you all for being here and I'm hoping we'll see all of you at CIT. And and thank you for all of your work this year. And I know it's been a really tough year and I'm hoping next year will be easier for everybody. Thanks everybody. Thanks, John. Thanks everyone. See you at CIT.